Wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. So welcome, everyone. Boring conference, isn't it? Wow. wow! Svetlana Kravchenko was passionate and effective in helping forge linkages between human rights and the environment. She passed from this world on February 10th, 2012 at the age of 62. Her influence had spread worldwide in her writings and her teaching, her legal activism, both in Ukraine and at the international level, and her mentoring of generations of law students, first in Ukraine and then in Oregon. Professor Kravchenko was a teacher and a scholar. She wrote 12 books in three different languages and more than 190 scholarly articles and book chapters. She taught for 29 years at Lviv National University in Ukraine. She taught for 10 years here at the university of Oregon. After attending her first public interest environmental law conference here in 1994, Svetlana returned to Ukraine and she founded the first environmental law firm in Ukraine, Ecology People Law. She worked at the international level as a citizen diplomat in the negotiations of the United Nations Aarhus Public Participation Convention and she served as vice chair of the Compliance Committee uh, of that uh, convention. She served in that capacity for 10 years. She worked on integrating human rights concerns into climate change negotiations. Upon her passing, Oregon Law School's Dean Michael Moffat said, Professor Kravchenko accomplished more on the international stage than perhaps anyone in the law school's 128 year history. Svetlana loved the outdoors. She loved involving her students in her exciting work. She loved being in national parks, 
Uh, she took her students to those parks to help teach them. In fact, a judge once said after her passing that when he was her law student, when he was a young student himself in Ukraine, she had taken her students down to the market and showed them endangered species, plants that had been picked and brought to the market for sale. And some 30 years later, the judge said, whenever he goes to that market, women scurry around hiding the plants that they are selling. <laughs> she loved wildlife of all kinds, but mostly Svetlana was a fish, and she loved being under the water. At the University of Oregon, she directed the LLM, Master in Laws program. Her students remember her from her fierce devotion to their welfare and their futures. We're going to now honor someone who is of, let's say, Svetlana's ilk. Gordon, do you want to come up and take over? Thank you, Professor Bonai. As you said, Professor Kravchenko was and remains an incredible inspiration to environmental advocates around the world. Land, Air, Water, and Pilk honor her legacy by recognizing the sustained dedication of an educator who exemplifies her values. She pushed the boundaries of academia and activism, inspired countless students, and extensively supported local communities to secure their environmental rights. When I consider these achievements, a scholar like Professor Parento comes to mind. Uh, to be mentioned in the same sentence with Svetlana Kravchenko is uh, deeply honoring and humbling. But honest to God, I'm, I'm not a scholar. Okay, so this, this award isn't for me. Um, you know, to be a scholar, you, you, you have to develop a large body of robust, rich, creative, original thinking. You've got to probe the deepest crevices of the law, what's good, what's not good, what could be improved, what should be saved, what should be discarded. You, you've got to write books. Hell, I, I can't even write a blog post. <laughs> so, you know, frankly, for an award of this stature and prestige, we've got to be talking about a serious scholar, activist, someone who cares deeply about people and the law. Mims? No, I, I am honored to even be mentioned as well, but for an award like this, it's going to have to be someone who, first of all, who loves nature, who just is immersed in nature, who has been his or her whole entire life and loves every little bit of it from the microbes and the plankton to, of course, the beautiful species that we revere, the wolves and the eagles and the grizzlies and the salmon. It's got to be someone who, who likes Svetlana, appreciated the human basis of our environmental law, who knew that at the very foundation of our environmental law lied the rights of, of, of humans and communities, who would actually go out into communities. I don't even travel much. Uh, but someone who goes out into communities and hears their stories and learns their traditions and then who somehow conveys all that and finds underlying principles that reveal their legal truth that, and helps them speak it. Someone who strikes me like Svetlana works with students as colleagues, as partners, not so much as students, but who works together with those we educate to solve the problems of the day, and above all, someone who just never gives up. I'm known for giving up now and then, but some, we need someone who just never gives up and who perseveres because there is always another battle, but there is always also more justice to find. That's, that's who we need, Pat. 
I want to call up Zig Plotter. Zig Plotter. Thank you. I'm so um, undeserving of this honor that I will not accept it. And uh, because, indeed, it's not me. It's not Wait me. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Who are you, young lady? <laughs> uh, excuse me. Could we call the security? I think this sounds a whole heck of a lot like my dad. What's your name? <laughs> my dad, my name is Andrea Rogers. And, and is Bill Rogers spelled with a D? I hear him. It is. I know him. That's got to be it. I, I need to say something formal, but, but I think, indeed, you lead off. Why don't you lead off? On behalf of the students of Land, Air, Water at this 2014 Public Interest Environmental Law Conference, thank you for your years of service. And you guys are just you know, I should say something, but can you say it something when I'm finished? Yeah. So why don't you sit down for yeah, a moment? Yeah, have a seat. Uh, this won't, John wrote the script, so it's not going to... No, I don't have a long speech. Um, so, but, I mean, the, the point is, Svetlana's uh, precedent is just extraordinary. Uh, this school, um, in, in March, two years ago, was choked with people, all of whom were choked up, um, with this amazing woman who was taken from us and from John much too soon. So it is really fitting that uh, we look for a shining star. A sh a sh louder? Oh, I was just saying shining star. Uh, and, and there's a bit of a biography here, but I, I think it should be noted, when he went to the investiture for full professor, he said, uh, there aren't any milestones in teaching. Uh, and I don't get any charge out of knowing that something I've written will appear in some obscure law review. He always was dedicated from the very beginning to making a difference. I attribute that in part to your mother. He married a Peace Corps volunteer, and that shows that, that, you, you, that certainly helped shape your life. Um, it, it turns out that he is a combination of superb technical ability and also uh, superb scientific ability. You're still on the National Academy of Sciences, aren't you? No. No, you were. <laughs> All right. Um, and, and I don't know of, of any other law professors that have done that. He has started uh, writing as a law professor, and, and I, uh, and, but also doing active work. He's worked with native communities here and, and in Alaska. Uh, you, what, what's that? All right. Uh, but actually, and with Ralph Nader, but, but Ralph Nader working with the tribes. Uh, I, I guess I ought to talk about it this way. I was once asked to write a blurb uh, for, for something that Bill had, had uh, written, a and I said, I don't know anyone else in the world who with, when you walk with him, you both chuckle and you also feel that you're plugged into an encyclopedia. <laughs> he, and that's really hard to do. Uh, and, and, and indeed, uh, there, there's one twisted mind in this room that figured out if you took all the pages of his books and articles, I think this is true, uh, although it comes from a source that I'm not sure is completely uh, accurate, uh, if you put all of those pages end to end, they would reach six times as high as the Empire State Building. They would equal seven Eiffel Towers and could barely be matched by 12 Seattle Space Needles. Did you know that? No. All right. 
this is an incredibly serious award for a wonderful person, but it's also important to note that this guy has the most delightful, sprightly smile of any law professor in the world. That, that he has a twinkle in his eye, it's the best twinkle of any law professors in the world. Uh, he also has deep thought uh, in a way that many of us often forget in the middle of the daily uh, uh, mess that we work in, tremendous deep commitment. He's the most valuable, the most fun colleague uh, I, I think we could ever have. And that's not a colleague just for law professors, it's for all the students he works with, the tribal communities, uh, as well as law professors, and, and, and also the public at large. He has devoted his life to this, uh, and, and his effect has been felt and will be felt uh, for generations. I ask you to stand once more and applaud this amazing man. I guess I wasn't the one in on the joke there. Uh, <laughs> uh, it is a great um, honor to be linked to Svetlana. And I would just say a couple things about our work in environmental law. Um, I know when I was a little boy, I raised uh, ducks, and they imprinted on me. I must have been seven or eight years old. And that means you have to be their mom for this four or five weeks. And then years later, I learned that somebody got the Nobel Prize for this discovery. <laughs> um, but everybody knew about this. Um, you, you, what part of what your experiences are, I know, um, I've told some of my friends this tale. I was raised on a pig farm. We had presentations today on CAFOs. I used to ride over with my Uncle Tommy to pick up the swill from Quincy, Massachusetts. The garbage went right into the trucks and straight to the pigs. And it was quite usable. There was no plastic in that garbage. Uh, the farmers used to pull the value, valuable materials out, silverware. My Uncle Tommy, uh, in fact, all the farmers had wedding rings. <laughs> they would frequently get thrown out with the garbage. Um, and Tommy, he had eight or 10 or 12 in the pig's sty. Um, I don't think they had uh, they just kept them. I, maybe they were prospective uses. <laughs> um, but that was the world we lived in. And I know, I remember uh, that farm uh, was taken by Route 24. And uh, we all remember our parents' voices as we grow up. And uh, I remember my mom, and I remember her saying the John J. Fulby Construction Company. That was not a favorable review. Uh, but I've heard here, as I've heard every year I come to this conference, these tremendous experiences that people have. And uh, their thoughts and their feelings, like Svetlana with the students and Svetlana underwater, that's what is the motivation. So those thoughts and feelings and beliefs will never change. Uh, so I guess as I come here year after year, I see everyone fighting the same battles we fought. You know, there used to not be really standing barriers. <laughs> it, was, it was nothing to it. So some of these things come, some go away, but uh, your life is the basis for your determination, and that will, uh, that will never change. So I feel good coming back here year after year, and thank you so much for this award.
Good afternoon. My name is Mallory Woodman, and I'm a second year law student here at the University of Oregon and a PILC 2014 conference co-director. This is my fourth PILC. I attended my first PILC in 2011 as an anthropology undergrad at Humboldt State University. My first PILC experience exposed me to the world of public interest environmental law. I was elated to find my heart's calling, something I had always wanted to do but didn't know existed. There was a path I could take, and more importantly, a community of like-minded individuals whom I could learn from and even one day be a part of. I had the same experience when I learned of the organization Survival International, the global movement for tribal rights. Survival works to protect tribal people's human rights and land by supporting legal representation, medical, and self-help projects. Through education, research, campaigning, lobbying, and protest on an international scale, Survival International has helped tribal peoples claim their rightful place at the table. Please welcome the Director General of Survival International, Stephen Corey. Thank you very much, Mallory. It's, uh, it's a great honor to be invited to your somewhat crazy conference. Uh, crazy but wonderful. Uh, it's an honor also to share a platform with Mary Pavel, who follows me, and indeed uh, to follow the preceding presentation. So I've been asked by Mallory to say a little bit about what I've been up to in the last four decades or so, and I've decided I'm not going to do that. Um, and instead, uh, I want to look a little bit at what I've been doing uh, and looking at very recently, because it makes some connections which I think are quite uh, interesting and relevant. Um, and I've got a 40-minute presentation, a bit more, 43-minute presentation, if all goes well. Uh, however, uh, there's a mistake, because it depends on people being able to see the screen. And I understand we're being broadcast, as it were, on the internet or whatever it's called, and I don't know whether people are going to be able to see what's on the screen, which is quite important, uh, on their YouTube little tiny screens. So occasionally I might need to refer to what's going on and even say some of it. But uh, really, of course, they shouldn't have stayed at home. They should have come here. It's, <laughs> it, it's a great city. The sun is blazing down outside. <laughs> uh, and uh, what do you next time come to Eugene? So I've entitled it, I'll need to keep turning around because I haven't got any notes. I've entitled it uh, Whose Law, Whose Environment, or Why Darwin is Dangerously Wrong. And I thought I'd begin with this quote, which you all know, um, from so-called Chief Seattle, mid-19th century, very famous. This is the version actually written in the 1970s by a Hollywood scriptwriter, but it's the one which is most obviously cited. And what I thought was quite interesting is the scriptwriter has the land being sacred to Chief Seattle's people, made holy in their memory. But if you go back to the 1854, the first time it was actually written down, of course, we don't know what he actually said. He simply said it's sacred. And it's been made sacred, been made holy by the presence of the people there. And I think that is a, quite an interesting uh, and not so subtle difference if you think about it. And I think you find that in all kinds of shamanic traditions. The land is actually made sacred it becomes sacred by virtue of native people living on it and with it. There are other quotations, but I'll skip them for time. So Mallory, by the way, the colors are coming out and certainly not my choice. They're a bit strange. I don't know how it's going to work. Uh, Mallory's already introduced survival, so I will not say anything more. Accept what survival isn't about. It's not about keeping anybody as they are. It's not about preserving cultures. And the reason we stress that is because as soon as you say culture, as soon as you say preserving, people think you're talking about the past 
Uh, people think culture is a static thing. Of course it isn't. We all know it's living, it's dynamic, it's constantly changing. It had always been constantly changing and it always will. You can't preserve anybody else's culture. You can, of course, keep elements of your own uh, and change other elements, but you certainly can't preserve a culture. Uh, we are not for profit, we don't get any government money, we won't take it, and we've got offices in the States and several European countries. So what do I mean by tribal peoples? Because I'm using the term in a way which in this continent um, it might be slightly different to uh, how it's often used. We're talking about peoples who are still largely self-sufficient. That means basically in their housing and in their food. They don't buy those things. They don't need to buy them. They are also clearly different from the dominant society. So that is our definition. We're not talking about the wide spectrum of indigenous peoples, about 370 million individuals in the world, but a narrower sector, about 40% of that. Uh, indigenous people sector, numbering about 150 million, we call them tribal peoples for want of something better, and it makes a certain sense in the UN um, documentation too. So, tribal peoples, what, uh, what are they not? Well, they're not backward. They don't live like our ancestors. They don't live like their ancestors. We don't live like our ancestors. Nobody lives like their ancestors, actually. Uh, a very common mistake, very common. They're not disappearing through any kind of culture clash or meeting of cultures. They're disappearing where they are disappearing, uh, which is in several places, uh, by the illegal theft of their, principally their land, their resources. Uh, it is against the law, it's against international law, it shouldn't be happening, but it still is. They're not, obviously, brutal savages, I don't have to explain that, this audience, I'm sure. Uh, neither are they noble savages. They're not necessarily more peaceful than we are. They're certainly not more violent. You all know that. He's come out green. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, of course, he didn't mean it. Um, what he meant was all white men are created equal. And that is very easy to see in other stuff uh, about him. Uh, can you read that at the back? Yeah? yeah? Okay. Well, I won't, I won't need to read it then. Uh, black people are certainly not equal. They are an inferior species, probably. So what about this chap? He, remember, is writing science. This is a scientific book. Here he's talking about people he calls the Fuegans. These are the Indians of the southern tip of South America from Tierra del Fuego, which he visited. And uh, you'll see what he says about them. Now we come to an American. We fast forward, uh, well, from Jefferson, we've gone a century forward um, to Darwin, now we go a generation forward to a, f a famous, very famous in his time, American lawyer and conservationist. He, Madison Grant, he had a terribly impressive uh, resume. Trustee of the Natural History Museum, uh, founder of Bronx Zoo, a gold medalist, uh, uh, trustee of the Zoological Society. He had a species of caribou named after him. Uh, he was a founder of Save the Redwoods. He had the world's largest tree was dedicated to him and a couple of others. Uh, he was a close friend of the president, Theodore Roosevelt. And he's, he's, on, on this side of his what he did, he's primarily known for being instrumental in the creation of these national parks. If you look at a fuller list of the organizations he was involved in at an executive level, it's even more impressive. So if you look a bit closer, you'll see some curious things. The Boone and Crockett Club, eugenics, immigration restriction. So what's that all about? This is the Boone and Crockett Club. Boone and Crockett Club's still going. Uh, this is from its website uh, a couple of days ago. 
uh, as you can see, it characterizes itself as a conservation organization. And it's also proud of its role in the creation of various national parks. You have to look pretty hard to see what it's really all about. It's, it's an organization of sport hunters. And that's, it was founded by Teddy Roosevelt. Madison Grant was a very prominent member of it. Uh, you won't, however, find old Grant in the website because he's been removed. Although he was a very prominent member, president, and all the rest of it for many years, uh, he's been airbrushed out of history, as indeed he has for most of the organizations he played such an important role in. Why was that? Oh, Boone and Crockett, of course, the name it gives, it's all given away in the name. It's Davy Crockett and it's uh, Daniel Boone. That's why it's called uh, Boone and Crockett, famous frontiersmen, hunters, uh, involved in several uh, Indian wars as well. So the creation of the national parks, which, of course, uh, started uh, here in this country, involved the eviction of the tribal peoples who were living on the land or using it seasonally. How does all this tie together? Why do sport hunters suddenly turn into people who want to restrict immigration? Well, in fact, if you follow the trajectory, it's quite clear. Their principal people they want to stop hunting are other hunters, commercial hunters, people who kill the bison, people who are hunting for meat, uh, for large-scale meat, for selling it, and so on and so forth. So the principal thing they wanted, the first thing they need to do to preserve their herds for their trophy hunting is stop the commercial hunting. So you create nature reserves, keep the commercial hunters out, get rid of the tribal people. They then removed the natural predators, wolves, coyotes, and so on and so forth. And this, of course, as we now know, was disastrous because it increased the size of the herd beyond the carrying capacity of the land. Uh, so the herd then grows weaker, lots of uh, sick uh, members, and so on and so forth. So then they invented game management, which basically means you kill the weaker members of the herd. All well and good. The principles of game management were worked out, uh, which were worked out then exactly the same as they use today. Uh, there's a problem then because many of them went rather further. And they thought, well, we've got to manage the human herd too. So that's why he was instrumental in getting through uh, anti immigration legislation. He wanted immigration to come from Northern Europe and not from South and Eastern Europe. Why? Because he characterized people into species and subspecies. Of course, lots of other people were. This is, he's carrying on a long tradition, which has been going on uh, since Darwin and, and before. Uh, but you will see, uh, this is a great simplification, by the way. His work is extremely complex. Again, it's scientific, of course. So you can see that the basic species are white, black, and everybody else. But if you follow the white species, the so-called Caucasians, you come to subspecies, Nordics, Mediterraneans, and Alpines. And this is one of his several maps showing you how that arose the Nordics are green, they weren't on the original, but never mind, they're sort of fluorescent green. Uh, the sort of yellowish are so called alpines, and the brown are the. Um, uh, who are they? They're the. No, the, the Mediterranean, the yellow of the Mediterranean is the brown of the alpines. So the brown, you notice, they're the poor countries of Europe, southern Europe, South Italy, Greece, Sicily, uh, also the Jewish areas. And this is where, of course, immigration uh, was coming into the United States when he was getting through these anti-immigration bills. He's got lots of maps, actually. Ah, Nordics is the same as Aryans, same as Teutons. He's got lots of maps showing you how all this arose uh, historically, um, and I mean lots. 
Uh, they are 99% rubbish, but they were accepted at the time. Of course, the problem with immigration and how it relates to game management is, is simply that. You, get, you mate a big bison with a little bison, you get something in between. It's always smaller than the big one. Or, to put it another way, the offspring are not so high as the higher parent. Of course, this is an era when uh, racism was uh, commonly accepted. I think probably very few white Europeans or those of white European descent, certainly Nordics, uh, did not believe in these kinds of racist ideas. It was common. And you can see it in postcards, America 1913. Uh, this is French from 1900, I think. Uh, these are British, uh, uh, also about Jews, but you can find them about uh, other races. You can see the same thing in adverts. Here's one from 1915. It's for a holiday resort. Uh, no Hebrews, that's no Jews, need apply. And this is, again, I repeat, commonly accepted at the time. So, you can control immigration to keep your herd healthy. And you can see why they were so alarmed. In 1860, almost all the immigrants were coming from the Nordic countries, uh, but from 1880, for several decades, the proportion of southern European immigrants, Jews, Eastern Europeans, Greeks, Sicilians, southern Italians, so on and so forth, was growing and growing and growing to the point where it crossed which is the point where the Immigration Restriction League was founded by Madison Grant, fighting for quotas, uh, which they eventually got into law, which then reversed that trend. So, how, back to how you control the herd. One way, control immigration. And it wasn't until 67 that the anti-miscegenation laws were made, uh, I've jumped a slide there, uh, illegal in the state. See if it'll work going back. Oh, yes, the second way you can control the herd, improve the herd, is you stop uh, interracial marriage, which is indeed what happened in several countries, including the states. And this is a graph uh, much more recent, 58 uh, for the next 50 years. So that's basically um, less than my lifetime. And you can see that the ratings, people almost always disapproved of interracial marriage when I was a child. The vast majority of people now approve of it. There are other ways. You can sterilize people. This was uh, common in the United States in compulsory sterilization laws. Uh, went on in Oregon until 1981. Concentrated on the mentally ill, also the deaf, blind, epileptics deformed lots of Native American and African American women. In California, about 10,000 women forcibly, compulsorily sterilized um, for being described as things like bad girls, passionate, oversexed. And it took a great boost in, in 1927 when Supreme Court Justice Holmes came out with that remark that it's actually better to get them before they're born, uh, then, it, then you won't need to execute them later. Or, a couple of years before Justice Holmes, uh, Hitler put it uh, actually rather simpler and more straightforwardly. But notice also uh, how it's the most humane task that mankind faces. Uh, the, the bad guys don't think they're bad. So, three methods, and of course, there's the obvious uh, fourth method of uh, preserving the health of the herd, culling, killing the weaker members. Now I jump continents, southwest Africa, it's now Namibia, 
I'm talking about the beginning of the century when it was German Southwest Africa. And we'll meet General von Trotter in 1904. And these were here his remarks about what he proposed to do to the Herero and Nama and some Bushman tribes. Basically, destroy them with streams of blood and money, uh, sparing no one. And that is indeed what happened. Nobody knows how many people were killed, several tens of thousands. It was uh, gruesome, bloody, and everything that uh, you can imagine in your worst dreams. The Brits did a report on it in 1918, but eight years later they destroyed the report because they wanted to foment better uh, relations with the German settlers. By this stage they were running uh, what was German Southwest Africa. So the report's whitewashed and the genocide disappears. And if you now put in a Google search, uh, at least when I put in a Google search, 20th century genocide, you get uh, this list here. Uh, you don't get any mention of the German genocide. You do get an interesting quote from Hitler about the Armenians. That was the Turkish genocide starting in 1915. As Hitler said, nobody remembers the Armenians, and certainly nobody remembers the genocide of the Herero and Nama peoples in German Southwest Africa. And that uh, continues to this day. This is Madison Grant's book, 1916. It had a lot of admirers. Uh, one of, you can ex extract almost anywhere from the book actually, but as you can see, uh, Negroes have demonstrated their stationary species. This is uh, Hitler's book, 10 years later. Uh, with a conscious and direct reference to the fact that they were copying what was going on in the States. And you can see that again in, in lots of different stuff. The connection between the Herero genocide and the genocide of the 1930s and 40s is direct. Uh, Heinrich Goering, governor of German Southwest Africa, father of Hermann Goering, Hitler's deputy, but perhaps, and there are lots of connections like this, I mean, re I really do mean lots, but uh, a, a good one to point out is this Dr. Eugen Fischer. He uh, was studying uh, African children who had sterilized in 1908, uh, got rid of the Jews from Berlin University in 1933, uh, studied other children in Germany, so-called mixed-race Germany in the Rhineland, who were subsequently sterilized, all of them were sterilized, uh, and uh, then after the war became president of the German Anthropological Society. A poster, Nazi poster, we're not standing alone. The shield is, of course, their sterilization law, and on the left, the countries that also have sterilization laws with the United States at the top. And if you're in any doubt, we should look at Herr Brandt, or Dr. Brandt here, uh, in charge of the German sterilization program. And he was put on trial by the Americans after the war. He could not understand why he was being tried uh, by a country which had practiced exactly the same things in the sterilization area. And he uh, referred to this in his defense. This is a paper from his defense. He cites Madison Grant's book, and he quotes from it. Uh, now, is all this past history? Well, not really. Here's a Brazilian deputy, uh, government deputy, uh, filmed about six weeks ago. I want to tell you, the same government, Sr. Gilberto Carvalho, who is also Minister of the President Dilma, is there que estão aninhados, quilombolas, índios, gays, lésbicas, tudo que não presta está ali está alinhado e eles têm a direção e têm o comando do governo. If you compare the list with those targeted by the Nazis, uh, you really only need to add Jews and Gypsies and you came 
come to the same kinds of people. There are fierce now anti-Indian uh, movements going on in Brazil. Back to Africa, this is Botswana. It happens to be the neighbor of Namibia, but that's a that's, uh, coincidence. In the center, it's come out green, is the Central Kalahari Game Reserve. And uh, this is the second largest game reserve in the world, the size of twice the size of one American state. I can't remember which. <laughs> Never mind. Um, <laughs> the, 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 it's huge. The, the Bushmen were evicted from uh, this land in 2002. Practically all of them, but a dozen managed to evade eviction. Uh, diamonds had been discovered 30 years before, which is what it was, 20 years before, which is what it was all about, although the government said it was for conservation reasons. They were, they were damaging the game. Uh, survival, anyway, uh, supported them taking the government to court, it was the longest, most expensive case in Botswana's legal history. Went on for four years. Finally, the Bushmen, somewhat to everybody's surprise, actually won and won the right to live in the game reserve. And uh, we have a picture of them celebrating that with the young character who's also... Everybody's green. Uh, <laughs> perhaps that's not inappropriate. The young guy has his I Love CK Jealous Central Kalahari Game Reserve t-shirt on which uh, survival got for them. The government is still trying to get uh, the Bushmen out of the reserve and the, the, the latest ploy is ban all hunting throughout Botswana. But before we come on to that, uh, adjacent to the reserve, it's not in the reserve, it's adjacent, there's an area which uh, Conservation International has been trying to turn into a game corridor for years. And they did a study which ran for several years, uh, costing several millions. In this area, there's a Bushman community, uh, and the government said it would evict them. Uh, we took that case to court too and uh, stopped that. Uh, during the process of all that, we asked Conservation International, well, hang on, you knew these evictions had happened. You couldn't have missed them. It was the biggest news story in Botswana and around for about uh, two years. Uh, surely you uh, incorporated some thoughts about this when you were studying this new so-called conservation area. And after a not very fruitful correspondence, they put this up on their website. And you can see that they have great principles of consultation and community engagement, which guide them. Whoever did this doesn't seem to have noticed that they also say they had no direct engagements with the community uh, at all. And this, as I say, was a study which lasted four years for several years and cost uh, millions. It's unfair to pick on Conservation International, of course. Uh, we could talk about WWF, we could talk about the eviction of tribal peoples going on today from so-called tiger reserves in India where there are virtually no, perhaps in some cases, no tigers. Uh, it's all about clearing the local people out for forest clearance, really. We could talk about their support for, um, for so-called eco-guards in Cameroon uh, indirectly through the government, but nevertheless, uh, it's their money which funds the government and uh, how those eco-guards are uh, beating up, torturing pygmies who are thought to have gone into the conservation zones where they, of course, had always lived. Or well, we could just look at their board and see who controls it and wonder why these organizations, it's the same with Conservation International, it's the same with a lot of them, why are they controlled by these uh, people who are basically corporate leaders uh, from uh, oil and energy, automobile, finance, uh, and so on and so forth. Well, of course, it always has been. Uh, this uh, organization was formed as a, uh, a, a coordination between the corporate and the government sector. Or, a couple of weeks ago in London, we have uh, some green royal gentlemen <laughs> uniting against uh, poaching. And in the front row, you, there's President Karma, Evicted the Bushman is now made Bushman hunting illegal throughout uh, Botswana. Uh, you might ask what these three gentlemen at the top do when they're not against poaching. <laughs> uh, I don't know if they've heard of Madison Grant. 
and actually the two younger ones were hunting two days before they did the announcement. Uh, they're not the only European royals, of course. Uh, here's the King of Spain. Oh, by the way, Prince Charles is now the president of WWF International. As this character, Juan Carlos, King of Spain, was president of WWF Spain until uh, this story came out a couple of years ago. So, uh, President Karma's banned all hunting, except, of course, sport hunting. So if your uh, people have lived by hunting uh, for generations, you can't do it. Uh, but if you can go and pay your money, uh, then you can. So here's a letter from me to, the, uh, to a Sunday newspaper that more or less puts paid to my chances of ever being off the knighthood. But uh, on the other hand, I only really wanted an earldom, and they don't give or even sell those anymore. <laughs> so that comes to my first kind of plea. I do, can you read that? It's fluorescent. It's addressed to conservation organizations. Please stop supporting the eviction of tribal peoples from conservation zones. Uh, it can kill them, uh, and it does. The irony, of course, is that actually these are the best conservationists, and you can now prove that uh, definitively from satellite imagery. Here's a picture of uh, eastern Amazonia. Uh, now, now, the black areas are now the, de the deforested areas. The areas with numbers are the indigenous reserves. They are forested. They should be green, but the machine has done its color changes. Uh, so you can see that the only areas which are not deforested are the indigenous reserves. Back to, to remind you of that graph, change in attitudes about interracial marriage, and uh, my wishful thinking uh, goes to a graph which changes attitudes about evicting uh, tribal peoples from conservation zones. I, I've given that a 10-year span. Um, realistic, who knows? Steven Pinker, a very well-known, popular science writer. Of course, uh, he is not a racist, nor is the next guy I'm going to be talking about. But nevertheless, look at what they say. They are saying that uh, tribal peoples uh, kill more people in war than states do. And here are his graphs. So they're all very scientific. Here are his graphs to prove it completely spurious. Those are supposed to be hunter-gatherers. You can't read that, I know. And then at the bottom is states. So those lines are the amount of people killed in war by these different kinds of societies. The categories are spurious and absurd. I could demonstrate that, but I haven't got time. So I'll just look at one line there, which is the longest. These are the people who kill most people, more people than anybody else in warfare. They're called the Waurani, they're a tribe in Ecuador. I was with them 30 years ago, 32 years ago. Uh, and uh, they, they do have a strong tradition of feuding, which does result in a lot of people uh, getting killed, or did then. That has uh, almost entirely stopped. But uh, from a most unlikely source, you can see peoples who, even before I was there, 40 years ago, understood why this might be. And this was evangelical missionaries who produced a comic book in uh, 73, uh, showing you the, uh, the Alcas is an old derogatory name for the Waurani. These are the same people. They had been attacked by the Spanish. They had been attacked by Rabatak. The rubber tappers, they had a legacy of hatred. So there might be some reason why there is a lot of killing within the Warani, which has escaped uh, Pinka. Or Jared Diamond. He thinks tribal societies offer us a window into how our ancestors lived for millions of years. I don't know how much we know about human evolution, but the... the uh, it, it is laughable um, if, again, this wasn't supposed to be science and enormously popular and indeed uh, highly respected. 
I stress again, I don't want any lawsuits, neither Jared Diamond nor Stephen Pinker are racists. <laughs> if there are any lawsuits, then I'll rely on the University of Oregon Law School. <laughs> what is the difference between what they're saying and what Darwin said? Well, it's a bit different. I, to me, it doesn't really seem that different, to be honest. I think they are winding the clock back here about 150 years. And I think we have to be very careful. So here's my second sort of wish list. And it's addressed to popular science writers. Please stop claiming tribal peoples are like our ancestors and are more violent than we are. It can kill them. And it does. And I could uh, talk about how that connection is made if I had more time, which I don't. Anyway, I hope I'll be invited back to your fantastic city in the future. Uh, that's just a plug. If you want more on what we think of Pinker and Diamond, you can find it on our website. Just put Brutal into a search engine on the Survival website. There's another plug for a, a book of mine, which is an introduction to tribal peoples. Um, it may be on sale here, but they're legal issues. Um, Anyway, that's the second edition. The one here is the first edition. I've only got a handful of copies. Uh, you can have it cheap, impoverished Oregon students, half price, overpaid Oregon lawyers, double. <laughs> uh, and a, a, a final plug, uh, Davi Kopenawa is the, the most well-known Yanomami shaman from the north of Brazil. He's just had a book out uh, by uh, University of Harvard Press um, it's a very big book. It's the most detailed uh, explanation of the Amazonian sh shamanism there has ever been or probably will ever be. Uh, and he's coming to San Francisco in April. If you're interested, put his name or something like that into the survival search engine and you'll get details. So, uh, to end, uh, I, this is a big subject, obviously. Uh, uh, you can't do it in 40 minutes, so what about two and a half minutes? So we've done this book, uh, which is designed to be read in two and a half minutes, which goes through some of these issues, not all of them. Uh, don't blink, we've animated it, that last two and a half minutes, so I'm going to play it. Don't blink because you'll miss the bit about conservation, which is about two minutes in. We're not getting sound. If we don't get sound, it won't make any sense. As we set out through the dense jungle, we had but one goal in mind. To bring the people sustainable development. I don't know how to... However, in this case, we did encounter an unexpected... Um, we are, of course, in the United States land of technological excellence. Uh, but it's not my fault, so I can say that. It wouldn't work in England either. But it does work if it all hooks up right. We had sound for the Brazilian. <laughs> So, so do you think you might have some? Let me... Ah. As we set out through the dense jungle, we had but one goal in mind. To bring the people sustainable development. However, in this case, we did encounter an unexpected challenge. We discovered that these people, in their own peculiar kind of way, were already sustainable. So all we could really bring them was development. We started by taking them through the process of participatory community project building, but they refused to fully participate. Next, we tried income-generating activities. But for some strange reason, they seemed satisfied with less than a dollar a day. We even tried empowering them, but their reaction was much more powerful than we expected. 
But we weren't going to give up on these people so easily. We knew they needed our help, even if they weren't aware of it. So we opted for the multi-stakeholder cross-disciplinary approach. We developed innovative private sector partnerships. Then we taught the people vocational skills that were adapted to a shifting economy. We created tough conservation measures to protect the environment from further harm. And we developed ambitious social safety nets to protect those unable to care for themselves. I'd say it's been a challenging process. We've learned many important lessons and we really look forward to applying them elsewhere in the future. But for now, let us just say, welcome to the Global Village. So a final wish list. If you think governments, corporations and conservation organisations should actually follow their own policies and laws, say so. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Howie Arnett, and I've been asked by Mallory to introduce our next keynote speaker, Mary Paddle. Uh, I know Mallory because she's a student in a class I teach here. I'm a, I'm a real lawyer, and I practice uh, representing Indian tribes, but I also teach Indian law here as an adjunct professor. And I know Mary because of my real job of representing Indian tribes. And when you represent Indian tribes, you go to Washington, D.C. When you go to Washington, D.C., you see Mary. Uh, she is the uh, Chief Counsel and Staff Director for the Senate Indian Affairs Committee. All the legislation that goes through Congress relating to tribes and Indian people has to go through the Senate and it goes through the Indian Affairs Committee. Uh, Mary has had that job for at least the last year. She was appointed by her home state senator, uh, Senator Cantwell, and because of a shift in sort of musical chairs and recently occurred in the Senate due to Senator Bacchus leaving to become an ambassador, her new boss is Senator John Tester from Montana. And tribes are very, very hopeful for uh, the future of Indian legislation through that committee and through Mary uh, and based on Senator Tester's uh, strong interest in, in Indian affairs. Uh, before Mary uh, joined the uh, Senate Indian Affairs Committee staff and became the chief counsel, she was like me. She represented tribes. Uh, for the Cadillac of Washington, D.C. law firms uh, representing tribes, the Sanosky Chambers firm. Uh, and I've encountered Mary over the years, I think about the last two decades in that, in that connection. I represent primarily the Warm Springs tribe here in, in Oregon. Uh, and before she uh, went to uh, Washington, D.C. to pursue an Indian law practice, she went to the University of Washington Law School and learned environmental law from, from Bill Rogers. And before that, she was at Shelton High School, Shelton, Washington. Uh, <laughs> there you go, Dartmouth, Dartmouth. But it's always important to remember your high school. Uh, she is from the Skokomish Reservation in Washington. And those of you who've ever been to beautiful Hood Canal, that's Skokomish country, uh, where Mary is from. So, Mary, uh, the stage is yours. Thank you, Howard, and um, it's always dangerous to be standing uh, between people and their food, so I will make my remarks straight. First of all, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I am Mary Pavel, um, Staff Director and Chief Counsel for the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs. I'm a member of the Skokomish Tribe, as Howard said. And I want to thank the University of Oregon School of Law and Mallory in particular for inviting me here to be uh, among this distinct, distinguished group of keynote speakers. Um, 
I am a graduate of the University of Washington School of Law. I want to acknowledge that and Professor um, Rogers and um, along with Professor Ralph Johnson taught me how to be a lawyer. So thank you. Didn't know I'd have the pleasure of having you here this evening, so thank you for being here. I'd also like to acknowledge my brothers and sisters who are in the room. Um, I'm the youngest of six children, and my presence here today in the position that I have is because of the path that they each blazed for me. So I want to acknowledge all of my brothers and sisters, including my older brother who um, was on his way here and couldn't make it, but uh, he's here with me anyway. Um, <laughs> Finally, I am staff director and chief counsel for the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs, um, but my remarks here today are my own. They do not, uh, should not be considered those of my chairman or my former chairman or any member of the committee or the United States Senate. And anybody wants to know about what's happening with the committee, because I'm not going to talk about that this afternoon because I'm a little tired of it. I'm happy to visit with you. You can lobby me up, get my phone number, come see me anytime. Happy to talk to you. Um, <clears throat> the theme of this year's conference, Running Into Running Out, reminded me of a time when I had the privilege of attending the Mid Northeast Midwest Institute on Health on the Health of the Great Lakes. At the, after hearing from some of the world's most noted scholars um, about the threats and dangers to the Great Lakes from invasive species to mercury. I was a little panicked about not only the health of the Great Lakes, but the health of the earth in general. So I shared this worry with my brother Michael, and uh, who you, you guys got to meet yesterday and we'll see again, and um, who's a professor here at the University of Oregon. And he laughed and he said, don't worry about the earth, Mary. Worry about human beings, he said. If we continue the path we are on, the earth will shed us like a menstrual cycle and start again. <laughs> the earth, she will be fine. Humans, that's another story. I'm not sure why, but him saying that actually comforted me for some reason. Thus, the choice for us as human beings is whether we will make the decisions, both big and small, that are necessary to protect not so much the earth, because as my brother reminded me, she will be fine, but rather to protect our own existence, as well as the existence of the creatures who the Creator bestowed on us the responsibility to protect. Now we as regular citizens, we make our choices in our lives about how we will ensure our existence. Will I drive a car? Will I take public transportation? Will I recycle? Will I buy my daughter organic milk? These choices require a balance in our lives. And in most cases, it is usually a balance of time and money. Do I have the time to take public transportation? The answer for me is no. Do I have the money to buy organic milk for my child? The answer there is yes. Rarely, I think, do people make these decisions based on whether what is better for the environment, what is better for their health, and the health of those they love. Those who do, in my mind, are true environmentalists, and my father, was probably the first environmentalist I met. Although I'm fairly certain he did not see himself that way, he just made choices he thought were best for his family. For most of my life, my father planted, I would say, almost an acre, acre of land for a garden. Now with six children, I suspect my dad made the balance and money was a reason, was one of the reasons he did this. But I think my father did this because he liked freshly grown food and because he wanted his children to have freshly grown food. In that way, he spoiled us. In fact, my brother, when my brothers were gone, my dad stopped having cattle because there was no one around to repair the fences anymore. Um, and uh, we had store-bought meat. My older sister, Barbara, and I complained that it was not as good as our homegrown beef so my dad, to accommodate our discerning palate, would go to the commissary and buy these big old sirloin rolls. He would chop up the steak and he would ground up the meat, the best store-bought meat he could buy because my sister and I couldn't stand not having homegrown beef anymore. My father never used pesticides on his garden. Again, the reason for his choice, I suspect, could have been cause, but I believe my father worried about the harm to himself, his family, and his land more than cause. I will say, though, while my dad was probably right, 
as a child eating broccoli and finding a three inch broccoli worm on my fork more times than I care to remember, I wish my dad had used a little pesticide to get rid of the critters, but alas, he didn't. My dad, but what my dad taught me that I had choices to make and the choices I made would impact my environment and consequently my health and the health of those around me. I didn't come here though today as a citizen who makes daily choices in her life about how I will affect the environment. I came to you today as someone who has spent her professional career working for policymakers, first tribal and now United States senators who have significant tribal populations in Montana, Washington, Alaska, North Dakota, South Dakota, New Mexico, Arizona. But I found that these policymakers strike the very same balance that my father struck in a, larger, in a much larger context. For more than 40 years, the overarching policy in Indian Affairs has been one of self-determination, empowering tribal governments to govern their people, their land, and their resources. In the context of the environmental movement, of course, this comes to us in the form of what is what we call treatment of state. I think the history of Northern Cheyenne and Crow Coal illustrates is illustrative of the difficult balance that federal and tribal policymakers have to make. In 1977, the Northern Cheyenne tribe submitted the first application. If you know Northern Cheyenne, they're poor. Northern Cheyenne are poor. They don't have anything. They're poor. But they were the first people to seek a more stringent class one air designation for their reservation, for their territory in South Central Montana. The impetus for Northern Cheyenne to exercise this authority and sovereignty was Montana Power Companies and four Northwest Utilities planned for two 760 megawatt coal-fired power plants in Cold Strip, Montana. Montana's Class II air status would have permitted hundreds of tons of hazardous emissions. For the no Northern Cheyenne, this was unacceptable. Their people already suffered from high rates of respiratory disease, and further, these emissions threatened important cultural resources to the tribe. The state of Montana did not challenge the tribe's designation, which is anybody in this room who's done Indian law can find that's very rare that a state doesn't aggressively challenge the exercise of a tribal sovereignty like that. But what's more surprising than, Northern China, than Montana not challenging Northern Cheyenne is who did. The Crow tribe challenged Northern Cheyenne's authority to protect its territory and its resources. Now, you see Crow? To the Crow, the Northern Cheyenne's exercise authority was a threat to its sovereignty, and it was worthy of another challenge to a tribe to its economic sovereignty, to the very basic necessity of their people. More than 90% of the Crow tribe's budget comes from coal development. The Crow reservation has a 23% unemployment rate with more than 30% of the reservation living below the poverty rate. Their community suffers from heart disease, cancer, and suicide rates that far exceed the rest of Montana. Thus, for the Crow tribe building an economy and creating jobs for their people to empower them to a better life is the fundamental purpose of the tribal leadership's mission. For the Crow, the development of their coal is central to fulfilling their mission. In the end, the Ninth Circuit upheld Northern China's Class I designation in Nance versus the Environmental Protection Agency. <laughs> Nance was the first reported environmental law, law case addressing the tribal implementation role and the first sanctioning EPA's treatment policy of treating tribes as states. The story of Northern Cheyenne's authority ends with the plant being built, but with conditions that ensured that the emissions from the plant would not infringe on the Northern Cheyenne's Class I air designation. It also resulted in the Crow tribe abandoning its plans for its own power plant because of the cost to accommodate for Northern Cheyenne's Class I era designation. Today, Crow still remains very dependent on coal development. The Crow tribe's reserves are estimated at around 9 billion tons. However, the United States is moving away from coal 
as a source of energy. It is estimated that 175 coal generating plants will be shut down in the next few years. Thus, while the domestic market for coal may be diminishing for whatever reason, the market in China is growing. Thus, the challenge that faces the Crow Nation now is the transport and export of this commodity to China. Many in the environmental community are concerned with the burning of coal in China and the impact that this will have on the global environment. Well, that may be a concern to some tr domestic tribal interests. The greater tribal interest is the impact of the transport export of this coal will have on the protected treaty protected rights and resources. The place that the coal will be offloaded from the trains and put onto ships would be the Gateway Pacific Coal Terminal. If constructed, it would be the largest terminal on the West Coast at 1,100 1, acres and would be capable of missing, mi moving 54 million metric tons of coal per year. The site of the terminal, Cherry Point, happens to be a sacred place to the Lummi Nation. There is a 3,000, 3,500 year old village site at this location. It was the first site on the Washington, in Washington State to be listed on the Washington Historic Register. In addition to being a cultural site, Cherry Point is the site of some of the most productive shellfish territory in the Puget Sound. Lummi is also home to one of the largest native fishing fleets in the country. Thus, the Lemmy Nation and its people are heavily reliant on the resources that could be impacted by the construction and operation of this facility. Beyond this, the ships that would carry the coal to China could be up to 1,000 feet long, weigh up to 25,000 pounds, and carry up to 500,000 gallons of oil. These massive ships would traverse the fishing territory of all the tribes in the Puget Sound. Thus, the impact of this terminal and its operation extends far beyond the Lummi Nation alone, but to all the tribes on the Puget Sound. In this respect, the Crow tribe's plans and hopes could have a significant impact on the very foundation of the tribal communities on the Puget Sound. Communities like mine, where 90% of the families living on the reservation are supported from treaty fishing and harvesting. Thus, the tension over Crow Coal continues in the form of environmental studies at the state, federal, and international level. In the Crow worldview, the, world gave, the Creator gave them coal, just as the Creator gave my people salmon and the wealth of the sea. Thus, the challenge for today's policymakers is to ensure that a balance is struck so both interests are protected and respected. For me, as one who works for policymakers, I believe the answer of how to strike that balance lies in federal laws defined by the Constitution, treaties, and federal statutes, and from the science that comes from examining the potential impacts. What we have to be cautious about is how easy the science can be manipulated an example of this can be found in looking at the fish consumption rates in Washington State and the effort by some to adjust these rates. Currently, the state of Washington estimates that the average fish consumption amount is 6.5 grams per day. That's about an one eight ounce fillet a month. According to various surveys of native communities, tribal communities, the actual average consumption is 200, 300, or even in some cases, 500 grams a day. And this fish consumption represents a critical component of how to gauge human health as required in the Clean Water Act. And at 6.5 grams a day, Washington's is the lowest in the nation. It comes from federal guidelines published in the 1990s, and even EPA has walked away from those guidelines. Thus, there was an effort to change these rates to reflect current reality, what people are eating. 
This effort was soundly defeated in the Washington State Legislature because business interests feared that a change would impact their bottom line. I find a quote from Jocelyn McCabe, a spokesman for the Association of Washington Business Interesting. According to a Seattle Times article, Ms. McCabe said, health and human safety is of course a first priority, but there are competitiveness issues going forward. It's natural to us to look at new regulations that will affect industry's capability to keep their doors open and people employed. I don't know, maybe I'm naive, but I don't think that's natural. I think what it should be natural is for all, for all of us is the truth. Is it true that the average person eats 6.5 guy, 6.5 grams of fish per day? If it's true, fine. If it's not true, then what is the truth? This is where I make the plug for the lawyers and the 2B lawyers in the room. Because in this case, those will be the truth seekers. A lawsuit's been filed against EPA pursuant to the Clean Water Act to, to get them to reset the fish consumption rates in Washington state. And I suspect those fish consumption rates will be adjusted. Then policymakers armed with the truth and the science will be able to make the necessary changes in the law and policies that will reflect what is really happening in Washington. To be sure, and I don't disagree with the Washington State business interests, there will be a cost to this. It will mean higher plane tickets, higher property taxes, higher sewer bills, in some cases sewer bills for the first time for people who have never had a sewer bill, more expensive food, and higher car taxes. But the failure to properly manage these risks and threats and know the truth is much higher. This is evidenced by the story of Church Rock, a Navajo community on the Navajo Reservation. From 1977 to 1982, United Nuclear operated a uranium ore processing mill in Church Rock. Of course, when you mine, you guys know, you get what you call tailings, the material that's left over when you mine a substance. These tailings are frequently contain toxic metals, and in the case of uranium mining, they can actually contain about 85% of the original ore's radioactivity. At Church Rock, these tailings were stored in a wastewater lagoon contained by an earthen berm 25 feet high and 35 feet wide. Apparently, at this time, this was state-of-the-art. It was someone's science. Someone's science said that this was okay. To store, an okay way to store 100 million gallons of radioactive waste. Unfortunately, the regulators didn't monitor the construction of the lagoon site or use or its use by the company or even regularly inspect the site. Basically, some person failed to ensure what the company said it was doing was in fact what it was doing. Consequently, on July 16, 1979, a 20-foot section of the dam breached and released a toxic flood of nearly 100 million gallons of hazardous liquids and 1,000 tons of radioactive solid waste and other heavy metals flowed into the Rio Porco and contaminated the upper Gallup aquifer. This was the country's largest spill of radioactive materials. It was added to the Superfund priority list in 1983. But to many Navajo people, this is home. This is where they live, raise their children, and herd and raise their sheep. So they continue to live there, let their sheep drink the water, let their babies play outside these toxic sites. As one Navajo put it, our umbilical cords are buried here. Our children's umbilical cords are buried here. It's a homing device. 35 years later, the cleanup continues from this disaster and other vestiges of Cold War mining. 
According to a new, recent New York Times article, federal officials are amazed at the extent of uranium contamination on the reservation. What's the joke? Oh my God, there's smoking going on in this room. Or what is it? There's gambling going on in this room. I find it sad. Well, to be honest, I don't understand how a federal official could be amazed. Weren't there people whose jobs it was to permit, permit and monitor these uranium mines? It wasn't like these mines sprung up out of nowhere. After all, the federal government, or more accurately, its contractors, were probably the largest purchasers of the uranium, uranium being mined. Now we have a community that is facing the untenable choice of abandoning their homes or continuing to live in what is a clearly toxic community. This is because somebody made the wrong balance and failed to truthfully, truthfully account for the risks and threats from this activity. Today we can look at EPA's recent final assessment of potential mining impacts on salmon ecosystems of Bristol Bay, Alaska. And people may here in the room know, I guess there's something great going on on the Pebble Mine Bristol thing. I don't know. I've been driving from San Francisco to get here. so But I think there's something big going on with Bristol Bay and Pebble Mine. But I think that we can look at EPA's assessment of this as an example of policymakers properly using the science to evaluate a proposed activity. For those of you who don't know, Bristol Bay supports the largest sockeye salmon fishery in the world, producing nearly 50% of the world's wild sockeye with runs averaging 37.5 million fish per year. Thus, any mining activity in the watershed has the potential to significantly impact the way of life for Alaska Natives in the region but also the commercial fishing community throughout the West. EPA's assessment on the Pebble Mine proposal, which would be the largest open pit mine in North America, found it would destroy up to 94 miles of salmon supporting streams and up to 5,350 acres of wetlands, ponds, and lakes would be destroyed. In its assessment, EPA determined that failures were possible at the treatment plant the transportation corridor, the petroleum pipelines, and the tailings dam that would result in catastrophic effects on the fishery resources. One wonders how different church work would be today if somebody had chosen to do this kind of assessment on that mine. My former boss, Maria Cantwell, was a strong proponent of EPA completing this assessment. And now armed with the science, she is advocating for EPA to exercise its authority under the Clean Water Act to prohibit the discharge or long-term storage of mining waste within the Bristol Bay watershed. No one can question Senator Cantwell's environmental bona fides, and I dare you guys to try. Uh, however, Senator Cantwell is not simply the net, for her it's not simply the negative impact that the mine could have on the environment, but also the risk that it, the activity poses to a key economic constituency for her in her state, the Seattle-based commercial fishing fleet, who are heavily dependent on the sockeye run in the Bristol Bay region. For me, the Pebble Mine is an example of how we as a nation should evaluate these kinds of activities thoroughly and honestly. Because what I know about human nature is that as long as there are minerals in the ground in Alaska, the Great Lakes, or the Southwest, we will try to extract them. Crow teaches me that my values and what is important to me cannot be what drives the outcome. Rather, it must be the science applied honestly within the framework of our nation's laws that will lead to outcomes that will strike the right balance. So with that, again, I'm happy to talk about anything anybody wants to talk about. Oh, I got questions even. Um, Have we what? There are, actually, and that's part of the things that we're talking about. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah? You're coming on five or six grams per day of fish, and they 
same thing was issued to South Louisiana and the Gulf Coast during the oil spill. And then today being EPA, FDA, NOAA, and a speaker that we had in this room earlier today, Jane Luchita, also stated on this edition that everybody along the Gulf Coast, including the fishermen, only a <laughs> I don't I don't know what other people eat, but I can tell you not in my community. <laughs> We're eating more than one fillet of fish at a month. That's all. I mean I don't uh, I, I think that science that's it's not true. Yeah. Okay. Well thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank everyone for attending the keynote address. We will now have the Indigenous Peoples Reception in the Longhouse, which is across from the law school courtyard. So please come and join us. And the Pilk celebration to follow at 8 p.m. at the Northwest Youth Corps.